Julian, some people claim that time is not real. Others debate that in, in, in an argument. You've talked about the, the, the mystery of how utter timelessness can create this, this feeling, this deep feeling we have of time flowing. How does that happen? Let me first of all start with why this has become such an acute issue, talking in conventional terms as if time exists. <laughs> so there were two really great theories, as I'm sure you know, developed in the, in the 20th century. The first was Einstein's general theory of relativity, where he made time dependent upon what matter is doing. If matter does something different, time flows differently. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later about, quantum mechanics was discovered. This was in the first place describing what atoms and molecules do and how they get the shapes they do and things like that. Now in quantum mechanics, that has a good old fashioned Newtonian absolute time. Mm -hmm. Newton said there is time that is flowing. It's like a river or, or it's sort of going along steadily along a line like that. And that time is a key part of quantum mechanics as it's formulated. And it's very mysterious because it's quite external to everything else which is going on in quantum mechanics. So this is, this has always disturbed people. So then about 60 years ago, people started seriously trying to put together these two theories to try and reconcile this discrepancy between them. And in particular, people, the bulk of scientists believe, and I do, and I think most of them still do, that quantum mechanics is really universal and is really very fundamental, and in some sense is more fundamental than Einstein's general theory of relativity, or at the very least, that it must be made amenable to the rules of, of quantum mechanics. Now, when this happened, particularly in the case when it's applied to a universe which is called spatially closed, that's a bit like in two dimensions, we're very familiar with the surface of the Earth that closes up on itself. Now, uh, geometers proved that this exactly the same can happen in three dimensional space. So, so if you have a universe which is spatially closed like that, in the 1960s, somebody called Bryce DeWitt, who was bullied into finding this equation, mm -hmm. as he says, <laughs> he says he, he only found the equation to get John Wheeler off his back. John <laughs> Wheeler is the man who coined the expression black hole. But he was desperately keen to understand how these two theories would be put together. So he kept on pushing Bryce DeWitt to find the equation <laughs> which would describe it. And when DeWitt found this equation, he uh, was very disconcerted to find that time had disappeared from it altogether. Mm -hmm. And on the face of it, it seemed that there was no time at all. It was just a completely static universe. It was as if there were lots of possible configurations of the universe which don't change. So let's think of those as individual snapshots. So I'm, I'm taking it down to two dimensions sure. instead of three. So it's just as if there was a whole vast quantity of possible snapshots. In fact, all possible configurations that that universe could have are, so to speak, there, and attached to them is a number which gives the, a probability. Now, this is all very mysterious because <laughs> the way I try and explain it is if there was a huge bag with all these snapshots <laughs> in there, but some of them are much more common <laughs> than other ones. And if you put your hand in, <laughs> you'll draw out one more probably than others. Yeah. And that's in very sort of rather simple, crude terms, is the picture that emerged. And people have been trying to make sense of this now for 60 years. And my way of trying to make sense of that, I thought for about 18 months, I was thinking, if this picture is right, where in this mathematical picture of those probabilities and the configurations associated with them resides the evidence that makes us believe we live in a universe that is expanding. You have to, you have to reconcile those things or you, you, it doesn't you, you, work. You, you've got to reconcile them things. And then I thought, then, then in a flash an idea came to me, it must be in the structure of the configurations that get a high probability. Now we know we live in a very highly structured 
universe mm -hmm. around us. You see it, the books in, in mm -hmm. this beautiful library. And then I thought of this wonderful thing that happened in geology. Until about Napoleonic times, pretty well everybody believed, at least in, in Western Europe, believed that the world had been created in about uh, 4,000 <laughs> BC, uh, 6,000 years before. Uh, so, but then geologists started looking very carefully at things. And in particular, a very interesting man called William Smith, who was born only about 10 miles from where I live in the village of Churchill, where Winston Churchill's family mm -hmm. came from. He was in, employed to go to mines to survey a canal to take coal from the North Somerset mines to Bath and Bristol. Mm. So he went down coal, uh, coal shafts and was absolutely amazed by seeing all the strata that mm -hmm. follow each other. Mm -hmm. And he got obsessed by this and he made the first geological map. Mm. And he was called Smith Strata because his obsession <laughs> with these things. And then he made an interesting discovery that if he went down a neighboring coal mine, the succession of strata were the same. same. The miners apparently hadn't noticed this because yeah. I suppose they always worked in, yeah. in one thing. Yeah. But then he made an even more interesting discovery that if you, uh, that in, in these strata, sometimes they were, from the point of view of the minerals in them, they were absolutely identical. And in our normal way of describing these things, this is because they were laid down when the conditions on the earth were the same. Mm -hmm. And then he looked even more closely and recorded carefully where he found fossils in these things. And then he found that strata, which had the same minerals, had slightly different fossils. Mm. And then, you start, then he started looking at all the correlations between the fossils and where they're embedded. And that's all in, in a static structure. That information is still there. In principle, you could still go down those coal mines in, in, in Somerset if they mm. were still operating and find exactly the things that Smith saw. But bit by bit, when scientists looked at this evidence, they said, how could this be? And they, they thought the only way it could happen was that the Earth must have an immensely much longer history than they'd previously thought. Deep time. Is deep easy. time. They discovered deep time. And that was actually in many ways more disconcerting for the very religious 19th century than the uh, Darwinian evolution. So apply that principle to your understanding of time. So my position is that all evidence we have for time is encoded in static configurations. Mm. And all of the static configurations we look at or experience subjectively, all of them seem to fit together to make a linear time. So the mm. evidence is there for a linear time. And that is what is so very remarkable, that all of it is without actually seeing an invisible time. But when we look at visible things, they fit together in a quite extraordinary way to tell that one story of a linear history. Not only do I have a personal recollection of a linear history, but everything around me and everything scientists tell me tells the same story. Bring back a speck of dust from the moon and it tells the same story. <laughs>